All right, good morning, everybody. Look at your neighbor and say, you're looking good this morning. Now look at your second choice and say, you are too. Now you're wrong for that, that you actually did that. But I'm so glad you guys are here at church today. Week number four of a little bit of wisdom goes a long, long way. We've talked about some incredible things and, and some foundational things. And we now, we know now more than ever that we need wisdom in how we lead ourselves, how we lead our homes, how we lead our families, how we lead in churches, how we lead in our workplace. Uh, we, we need God's wisdom. Somebody say amen to that. Proverbs chapter four, let's all read this out loud together. One, two, ready, read. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. There's only two things in the Bible where God's like, you better get these two things. One of them is Jesus and the other one's wisdom. We need both. Wisdom is supreme. It's, a, it's, it's so important. The whole book of Proverbs about you got to get it. Whatever it costs, you got to get it. Billy Graham uh, it said it this way. Oh, let me go this first. Bottom line, before we get to the Billy Graham quote, wisdom comes from God alone. It's the bottom line of this whole series. Wisdom comes from God alone. You can't Google it. It won't, you won't, it won't show up. Man's wisdom will show up. Some armchair theologian who refuses to submit to authority and use their life to make a difference will show up. But no one worth listening to will show up. Wisdom comes from God alone. Now, if there's somebody who is trying to lead you towards God's word, that would be wisdom. But wisdom comes from God alone. Let's say that out loud. Wisdom comes from God alone. One, two, ready, go. Wisdom comes from God alone. Billy Graham said it this way. Knowledge is horizontal, but wisdom is vertical. It comes down from above. We can learn a lot of stuff uh, from each other. We can learn a lot of stuff through research, but wisdom comes from God alone. We looked at some incredible things, and last week we talked about being wise with our words, with our mouths. If you missed that last week, you still need to listen to it. Today, we're talking about becoming wise in our conflict. Becoming wise in our conflict. Now, I know that this message doesn't apply to anyone in the room. I know that. You don't have any conflict. I get it. First service, they, all the people with conflict were in the first service. But you guys, none of you have conflict. You agree with everyone. There's no problems with anyone. But in the event that conflict does happen to emerge in your life, I'd love for you to be able to be prepared and to handle it with wisdom, okay? So we're going to look at some biblical principles on how to handle it. And then at the end, we're going to get uber practical, Okay, put your hands over your heart because this needs to be open today. Father, would you open this thing up today? Would our hearts and our minds be connected to processing the word today? And when the word of God, as it's planted, grow into something foundational and strong and values-based, truth-based, that changes our lives forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We increasingly live in a world where we're faced with lots of conflict. Now, I wish I had better news for you. I wish I had better news for you, but there's nothing you can do to stop it. There's nothing you can do to stop conflict. Why? Because to experience conflict is to be human. To experience conflict is to be human. It is unavoidable. Conflict, by definition, is a serious disagreement regarding a meaningful situation. Now, don't let this definition pass you by. A serious disagreement regarding a meaningful situation. So this isn't about preference or specific sports teams or it, like, I like this, you like that. It's not, that's, that's not, we're, we're talking about a serious disagreement regarding a meaningful situation. So some of the things that you might be defining as conflict in your life are not. It's just frustration. So we have to start out the day by defining it correctly. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about, because abuse is not conflict. Abuse is abuse. And I'm not talking about, like, if you're being abused by your spouse, don't just say we're having big conflict. No, it's abuse. So I'm not talking about remaining in a dangerous situation or some dysfunction. I'm, I'm talking about the normal, emotionally charged disagreements that you and I have with people. 
Now, to be human is to experience conflict. You have conflict with your children about how much screen time they have. Conflict with your spouse about a financial conversation. Conflict with your roommate about the tidiness of, of the house, of the room, of the dorm. Conflict with a church about differences in style um, or a minor theological approach. We need not be surprised when we experience conflict. But we are. Like we wake up every day thinking like there's not going to be conflict. If there's no conflict, you're not breathing. There's conflict all around us. And, and we need not be surprised when we experience it because for some reason, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I am often surprised when I experience conflict. I'm like, I didn't see that coming. I didn't think it was going to be like that. I didn't think it was going to be that hard. I thought this was going to be stress-free. I thought this was going to be perfect. When, when I married him... When we, I thought he was going to be the same gentleman that courted me, that convinced me to marry him. But then something happened, and after he sealed the deal, now he burps his name. What happened? It's not what I thought it was going to be, and now there's this conflict. Well, conflict shouldn't surprise us. It's everywhere. It's part of being human, so we got to talk about how to handle it. God's way. But be encouraged, the Bible is full of conflict. It's an incredible book. It's full of conflict. The early church walked through a lot of conflict. When we experience conflict, there's three ways in which you and I respond. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one is we escape. We escape. We see conflict as something that should be avoided at all costs. I mean, when, when conflict is coming, I mean, you're like a chihuahua in a thunderstorm. You're shaking. You got to run. You got to get out of here. Like you're, 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 you're just trying to get out. Of, no, no, no conflict. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I don't know what to say. I don't know what they're going to do. And then you're, you feel like your, your uh, stress level is rising. You just got to get out. We see conflict as something to escape. And then there's the other group of people in this room who see it as an opportunity to defeat someone. You see it as attack. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to win this argument. I'm going to win, or I'm going to defeat my boss. I'm going to defeat this person. I'm going to go to this board meeting and defeat the chairman of the board. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat the HR director. I'm going to defeat the teacher. I'm going to, like, I'm going to win. I see it as an opportunity to defeat someone. And then there's the third option where we have the opportunity to make peace. It's an opportunity to respectfully and wisely negotiate the differences. So where do you go when conflict arises? Where do you end up? I suspect a high percentage of you feel the need to respond with escape. You feel the need to, to run, to escape, and and you don't want to deal with it. You didn't see it dealt with well in your childhood, and you just don't want to deal with it now. And so you hide those conversations. And then there's a, another, so I expect that's a high percentage. And then there's another high percentage of you in the room that are number two. You, you tend to respond with attack. And then there's many of us in this room that are highly talented, and we are ambidextrous. You are really good at doing both. And we can go either way depending on the day. Somebody say amen to that. I, by nature, tend to go to number two. I, I tend to want to prove my point and get something across, but I've experienced them all. I've escaped from conflict before, and, and, and I remember, and I'm not proud to admit this, and, and you know, what you think whatever you want to think, but I've hid from people before. And it was back in the mask wearing days and, and, I, and I went to H-E-B and I was so grateful for the mask that day because there was somebody I did not want to talk to at H-E-B. And I had the mask on, I had like a hat on and, and my hoodie because it, it, it was kind of chilly and, and I remember walking in and I, I had two boxes of, of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, not the family size, the new giant size. And I walked like this with these blinders to my basket and put them in the basket, and, I, and I, I, I don't, I'm not proud of that. And don't act like you hadn't hid from somebody before. We've all hid from somebody we didn't want to talk to. And then we've all felt that moment where you lock eyes, and then you're like, 
And you're hoping that they were looking above you or around you. We've all hid from people before. And then I've been on the attack side before. Your your blood flows faster. Your temperature goes up. You feel like you've been saved by William Wallace and anointed by Chuck Norris. You are just ready to win this argument and defeat somebody and come hell or high water. I'm going to win this argument. But generally in my work life, I tend to stay in number three. I tend to stay in the meet, make peace side. And I've always wrestled with the tension of why am I better at making peace with, with all of these pretty intense, profound disagreements that people will have and help them find agreement. And then when I get home, it's like I've one or two. Why is there a difference? And I've wrestled with that environmental side and, and all of that. Now, those are the three options, escape, attack, or make peace. And last week, this, uh, this last week, I had to go to the DMV where the devil lives. <laughs> and I went to the DMV and I'm standing in a line that was abnormally long. And, and so for, for my, my blood is starting to boil a little bit because I hate waiting in line. And then I'm like, my taxes pay for more than this line. You know, I'm just like starting, like my brain is going through all this. And I'm standing there with all of my paperwork that has been completely filled out because I'm a good citizen. And I filled it all out the right way. And I'm ready to approach the counter with a smile on my face and Jesus in my heart. And this, she says, next. And I can already tell, because I can see the soul through your eyes. I could already tell when I walk up there that the devil was handling my paperwork. And I walk up to the counter and she's looking at me and you would think that she is a really old, 99-year-old, snarky, ticked-off woman with cat-eye glasses who can only see you with bifocals and that she would look up with you like this with disdain with the devil in her heart. But that's not who it was. It was a 27-year-old, fresh out of college looking and she walks up and she, she looks at me and I could tell by the way she looked at her computer with joy and how she looked at my face with hatred that it was about to go down. She hadn't even seen my paperwork yet and I set my paperwork down and then she opened it up and I was just trying to, I was just trying to get some tags for a trailer and, and she opens it up and she puts all the paperwork out and she doesn't say hello. She doesn't say, how are you, Mr. Kiker? She doesn't say anything. She looks at it, she goes, oh. And I was like, it's on. I'm gonna escape, I'm gonna attack. Make peace is not an option. And I'm feeling it. And what's even funnier is I had just submitted these sermon notes to the team 30 minutes before my arrival. And immediately the test from heaven had come in the form of this young woman at the devil's motor vehicle, the apartment of motor vehicles. So I get there, she opens, she's like, oh. And then with the smirk on her face, she's like, I, I need to get a second set of eyes on this. And I was like, I bet you do. Go ahead. Go ahead, get a second set of eyes on this. I hate paperwork. I don't like Excel, I don't like computers, I don't like paperwork. I just want everyone to do their job and leave me alone. Just help me. Obviously, no one wants to be here. This is worse than the dentist. Nobody wants to be here. So just be nice. She couldn't, though. It's not in her DNA. She goes and gets a second opinion, and this lady walks up, and she's like, Sorry, we have lots of problems. I'm like, <laughs> praise God. Praise God. I was cussing in tongues. I don't even know that's possible. <laughs> she takes my paperwork and she looks at it. And not only did I not get my tags, she looked at me and I, and I said, ma'am, I don't. She goes, do you want your, t your trailer titled or non-titled? And I said, ma'am, I didn't know that you could have a non-titled trailer in the state of Texas. I thought everything had to be titled. And she goes, well, you bought a non-titled trailer once, didn't you? Obviously, it can be non-titled. And I'm like... I can do all things through Christ. I can do all. I'm feeling my blood boil right now, just telling you the story. <laughs> now, I didn't get my tags that day. The paperwork's still sitting at home. And, and she said, sir, you're going to have to fill this out correctly. And she said, you checked the wrong box. I said, can I just mark it out and put my initials like I did on a mortgage document? Obviously, that was important. And she's like, no, the state will not allow for corrections. Like, it's funny because we have a department of corrections and I can't make a correction. Anyway. <laughs> I'm just wonder if you could put yourself in my shoes 
Now, I did a really good job. I, she walked up when she was like, Bleh. look at this awful paperwork. That This terrible citizen who obviously is stupid filled out this paperwork and brought this trash to me to process. How dare you insult Governor Abbott with this trash? <laughs> that individual, I just, I just looked at her and, and I said, hello, ma'am, how are you today? And she ignored me. And then at the end, I said, thank you for your help today. I really appreciate you looking into it and getting a second opinion for my benefit. Thank you. And then I walked out and I got in my car and I was like, ah! Ah! And I called Kelly and I was like, ah! Do that in your car, not at them. You got a choice. I don't know if I made peace with her that day, but she probably went and hung out with all her librarians and accountants and DMV people because they all probably hang out together. <laughs> that was rude. I'm sorry, but true. Anyway, she's probably like, just listen to what this idiot did. I didn't make peace with her that day, but I did not attack or escape. And I wonder if in those moments... Like if you've gone the escape route and you just bury the conflict, which we all know comes back as stage four cancer. A conflict doesn't go away, it just grows in the dark. And we all know if you just explode on somebody, my luck, there would have been three visitors from our church last Sunday in the line behind me. And so I, I, just, I just wonder like if you've ever handled that conflict, because I've blown up before and made things worse and then I've hid things before and made things worse. And, and then I get in my car and I'm like, why? This is not a healthy way to handle this. Have you ever asked yourself that? Like me blowing up on the Walmart cashier was not a healthy way to handle conflict. Me avoiding that conversation with my parents for 15 years is not a healthy way to handle conflict. There's got to be a better way. Have you ever asked yourself that? And here's the invitation today. If you're going to mature in Christ, you've got to learn how to deal with conflict. You cannot grow in maturity in Christ and not know how to handle conflict. So all you conflict avoidant people, you might look mature in Christ because everyone thinks you're peaceful, but inside you're a ticking time bomb. And then all of you other people who just fly off a handle at the DMV, we all know you're immature because you told us, you just showed it to us. And so if we're going to mature in Christ, we all have to learn how to deal with conflict because we can't avoid it. We can't avoid conflict. It will come. And for some of you, it'll come today now because you just heard this message about it. But it will come. We all need to move into the life stage of learning how to be peacemakers, not peace fakers. Because some of us are really good at faking peace. Oh, everything is fine. We just get along. And we all know that that's not true. And if you've ever heard the phrase, I'm fine, you know it's a lie. All you married people are laughing because it's never been true. You've never sensed it in the room and said, are you okay, honey? I'm fine. And that's been correct. Well, okay, let's go then. It never works that way, ever. Deep down, you know that there's a conflict in your life right now that you're not handling with wisdom and you need God's help. Every one of us in this room have something of conflict going on in our life right now where we need God's wisdom. So I've got seven steps that are just from the Bible. They're not mine, but they're all seven things that I've walked through, and there were a lot more, but for the sake of time, went down to seven. And these are the bedrock ones that have been very helpful to me personally, and I believe they'll be helpful to you. And so they all have got scriptures attached. It's not self-help stuff from a self-help book. This is from God's word. Number one, to resolve conflict, I must lower my voice. And that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. To resolve conflict, I must lower my voice. God made me an aggressive personality, and he wants that personality under control. Just because you're wired a certain way doesn't give you freedom to say whatever you want. And just because you say, bless your heart, doesn't mean you get to say anything you want after that. So you've got to lower your voice. Look at Proverbs 15. A tender answer turns away rage, but a prickly, sharp reply spikes anger. Some other translations use this word, prickly, harsh, sharp, grievous. All of those have at the bedrock the ability for poor word choice and volume. And, and it's, it's this prickly, sharp, like just going at somebody. It's like, and then our, our voice gets louder and louder and louder. Conflict calls for calm 
presence. It calls for it. It has to have it. It needs it. And you and I remove the calm when we start to fight dirty. What does fighting dirty look like? The silent treatment. That's not helpful, like sleeping on the couch, avoiding each other in the hallway. Like you got a, you got a tiny hallway and you're like passing each other. You're like, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like you don't know each other. It's not helpful. Lecturing condescension, name-calling, sarcasm, avoiding. Then it gets worse. What about physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, passive-aggressive behavior? I'm fine. Whatever you want. None of that is fighting the right way. That's fighting dirty. And we remove the calm when we let ourselves go that way. And I'm telling you, there is a physiological part of this as well. We were created on purpose, for a purpose, by God, in the image of God. You were not a monkey. You were not an amoeba. God didn't say, bang, and it all happened. Those are all lies. You were created on purpose, for a purpose, in the image of God, to do something on this earth on purpose. And somebody say a big loud amen to that. Since that is true, and since God designed our bodies according to the rubric of him, it is important that you understand how he made your brain. There's a physiological response to conflict that you and I need to know about. God created us this way, that our brains do not operate at the same level of processing at the, at, all the time. It's like, it's like an old computer, and you had to run defrag. Who remembers those days? And it was like, and it would be running slow, and you get out your old Packard Bell, and, and you call, it was before Nerd Squad or whatever they're called, and you're like trying to call your friend, and you're like, hey, my Packard Bell computer won't connect to AOL. And they're like, have you run defrag, C colon forward slash whatever, defrag? I don't know. And you're like, no, I didn't. Do you work at the DMV? You know, it's like you're like trying to get it working. But our brains don't operate at the same level at the same rate all the time. There's a lower thought process in our limbic system, which is responsible for the emotional instincts, instincts, the reactivity, the survival. If I'm thirsty, I'm going to get a drink. If I'm hungry, i got to find some food. And then there's the higher thought processes in our prefrontal cortex where it's responsible for speech, strategy, planning, negotiation, conversation, intelligent conversation. And the ability to problem solve lives in our cortex. There's nothing about our limbic system that can solve any problems other than basic survival skills. When you and I get fearful, angry, or worried, we live in the limbic part of our brain. There have been studies where they hook people up to all these machines, right? And then they're activating different parts of the brain and they're finding out which parts are firing. Never, ever, ever are you physiologically possible by God's creation to solve meticulous problems when you are activated in the limbic system. It is physiologically impossible. You will only yell and make things worse at the DMV. And so we have to find out how do we activate our prefrontal cortex and deactivate where we naturally want to go in the limbic system. Because when we get fearful, angry, or worried, we automatically go into the limbic system. We're created by God that way to survive. But in the limbic system, we don't think straight. Have you ever told somebody, man, they just ain't thinking straight. They're, just, they're not thinking straight. They're not thinking right. And when we are there, we call names, we yell, we say things we will later regret. Like we, we tailgate people on the highway to show them you don't cut me off without paying a price. And we, we flip people off and we yell and we scream and, and we, we sit at home in our pride and know that we're right until we realize we were wrong. Anytime you're in a conflict, you naturally drop into reactive thought. We aren't thinking smart anymore. We're thinking dumb. And we need tools to step back into higher thought during times of conflict. We need wisdom for our conflict. And the Bible has these answers. So here's an easy way for us to remember it. The more we raise our voice, the more we lower our intelligence. It is physiologically created by God a fact that the more you raise your voice and get yourself in your limbic system, the less intelligent you are at the moment. So that's going to say when you're emotionally charged in an argument and you're feeling concerned or you start to cry, you're not even thinking logically. You're thinking about your needs and how you were hurt. And you're gonna get your point across. 
and there's not intelligent conversation in those moments because we are getting into a place of reactivity. And this is because of the neuroscience behind which God created called mirror neurons. And you and I have something to do with this because remember the earlier thing said, as maturing Christians, we've gotta learn how to deal with conflict. So mirror neurons would say, when somebody's mad at you, you get mad at them back. When somebody throws an insult at you, you got a really good mama joke ready to go. Like it's just there's these boom, 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 boom. These back and forth, back and forth. Mirror neurons are the ability to feel what you see. And so you're feeling what they're giving you and then we feel it, then we give it back and they feel it, then they give it back. It's a crazy cycle. This is, where, this is why there's like movies, right? It's like we go to the movie theater, all that is is a science experiment on mirror neurons. You watch Titanic and you cry it again. You know he's gonna die. You know she pushed him off the door. You know that. You know that. You know when you watch Gladiator that Marcus Decimus Meridius, the leader of the Felix Legions, the true servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, is the man who's gonna kill Commodus. And you know it's coming and you still get full of rage even though you know it's not real and you're in it anyway. And you're just, like, you, you can feel what you see. Those are mirror neurons. Someone crosses their legs in a meeting, you cross your legs. Someone goes like this, you go like this. You're, I'm, I just ruined your week. You're going to see it now. The rest of your week, you're going to feel it. You're going to notice it and see it now. Basically, mirror neurons are the biblical process of reaping what you sow. It's you get back whatever you give out. And maturing Christians do not wait for the other mirror neuron to give us what we think is acceptable for us to change our behavior. We set the tone. As maturing Christians, we bring peace to conversations. Immature Christians use the Bible to beat people up. Mature Christians bring peace because we have in our hearts the prince of peace, Jesus Christ. Somebody say a big, loud amen to that. So lower your voice. You sound squeaky when you yell anyway, so just calm it down. Number two, breathe and slow down the pace of your speech. The more angry we get, the faster we talk. Have you ever heard somebody yell real slow? (laughs) I can't believe you! Never happens. It's like, I can't believe you! You think they're speaking Chinese? You're like, what are you saying? My kids will do that, and I hate having a two-story house for this reason. They'll just yell, and I hear the word hate, and I hear something hit, and then I hear a scream, and I hear another thing, and then I hear someone yell, the snake got out, and it's just all these... (laughs) And I'm like, I'm not coming up there unless someone's broken. You come down here and fix it with me. I'm watching Forge and Fire. And so there's these conversations that we gotta slow down, we gotta breathe. And there are certain triggers, we all have different triggers. And you know when you get triggered because you start to breathe shallow, which reactivates your limbic system. And around and around we go. We gotta breathe and slow down the pace. When we rattle off, it puts others in a defensive posture. When when you feel like someone's going, you're like, but when it's calm and you can talk, the defenses come down. Proverbs 29, 11, fools give vent to their anger. So only a foolish person would rattle off a bunch of stuff super loud and super fast. So the next time you're watching somebody fight or you're in a fight and you're sensing that you're about to be a fool, realize what the Bible said. Bide your time. Breathe. Slow down. The wise slow down. The wise listen and slow down. So how do you calm a conflict? You breathe and slow down. Thomas Jefferson said, if you're angry, count to 10. If you're really angry, count to 100. That was his quote. Proverbs 16, 18, first pride, then the crash. A proud attitude brings ruin. So how do you keep the peace? A calm, cool spirit. Ecclesiastes 10, a calm disposition quiets intemperate rage. So even if someone's coming at you, you physiologically can change the environment of the conversation by being mature and owning the moment and not letting it get to you. Breathe 
and slow down. The New Century Version says it this way, remaining calm solves great problems. And the reason why I read the other version too is because it talked about a disposition. A calm disposition can, can solve intemperate rage, quiet intemperate rage. A disposition is not just your words, but your attitude, the feeling you bring to a room. Your body language, it's all part of that disposition. Wise people resist the urge to mirror an angry person's activity. And I like to think I was a little wise at the DMV. I'm just saying. Because in those moments, I had to dig deep into my Holy Ghost to be chill. And I think in those moments, without us having these tools, we can get in trouble. So lower your voice. Breathe a little bit. Slow down the pace. These are all biblically-based things that work with your physiology. Isn't that incredible? Isn't God awesome that way? And number three, listen more than you talk. This goes back to last week's sermon. James 1.19, open up your ears and harness your desire to speak. Don't get worked up into a rage so easily. Harness your desire to speak. Proverbs 13.10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. The message translation says it this way, an arrogant know-it-all stirs up conflict, but wise men and women listen to each other's counsel. And this might be hard to believe and you might disagree, but we just read it in Proverbs 13.10 that pride is the source of conflict. Think about it. When you're angry and there's a conflict involved, it's because both parties want something they're not getting. And it's like, I deserve it. And my, my voice matters. And it's like we're putting ourselves on this pedestal instead of slowing down, breathing, listening, and doing the other things we're about to reveal. Proverbs 18, 19, a person who answers without listening is foolish and disgraceful. And I wonder if maybe the last time you watched an argument, um, when's the last time you watched a presidential debate and left feeling inspired and full of wisdom? Never. Because we just argue and yell and throw insults and scream and raise our voice and look for jabs. It's, it's actually disgraceful. Number four, so listen more than you talk, slow down, breathe, and listen for the hurt behind the words. If you get this, you'll really make progress in your relationships. Listen to the emotion behind the words. What they're saying is not as important as what's behind the words, the emotion behind the words. Do you hear fear? Do you hear depression? Do you hear anxiety? Do you hear jealousy? Look for the hurt behind the words. So many times we argue about specific words that were said. And I'm bad at this. I'm like, you didn't say that. Here's how you said it. Our short-term memory is flawed, so we don't really remember exactly what was said. And that's why that commercial is so funny, where they throw the red flag and replay what was said. Because we all know we wish we had that red flag to replay what was said. But that's not the issue. Knowing what was exactly said is not the issue. It's what's behind it. And look what Proverbs has to say about it. Each heart knows its own issues. Every heart knows its own bitterness. Every heart knows its own bitterness. There's something in there. Basically, everybody has a hidden pain. And when I was at the DMV talking to that young woman, I began to think, and this brought my grace level higher. What if she got slapped by her live-in boyfriend last night? Like, what if her behavior right now is the absolute best that she humanly can do to keep her job? And in some arrogant, prideful Christian comes up to let her know he is unhappy with her customer service and not only cause her to lose her job, but to get beat worse. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't report bad customer service. She just worked at the DMV. They all act that way. So I wasn't going to report her because I'm not trying to change the government. I'm just trying to get tags for a trailer. I'm not saying you don't handle things if things are personally disgraceful to you as a customer. But I, I think we all need to take a chill pill, number one. And number two, customer service is bad everywhere right now. And number three, what about the person behind the activity? 
And I was like, well, maybe it's an extreme example. And I'm having all of these thoughts while she's getting her second opinion, second set of eyes. And, and I'm thinking, what if, like, she doesn't know Jesus and she's, she's been dumped? Or what if she was left at the altar? Or what if she's been sheltered and this is her first real job? And what if she is divorced and has a bunch of kids and this is her third job? And, and I start to think about, I don't know this woman at all. And I can have my frustrations, but there might be a pain behind the behavior. I would say most of the time, there is. We got to give people grace on that front. There's a story of two friends, and one one friend said, are you my friend? The other one says, yes, I'm your friend. And he says, are you my friend for life? Yes, I'm your friend for life. Then tell me, where do I hurt? If you don't have anyone in your life that knows your pain, you don't have any friends. You have a bunch of acquaintances that parade as friends that you can have dinner with, but that's not a friend. A real friend is someone who knows your pain. A real friend is someone who knows your hurt. And guys, we're bad at this. We'd rather just talk about football and scream about Jerry Jones and wishing he was gone and all those things. Like We can all get mad about that and go hang out and talk and have dinner and gloss over all the problems. But at the end of the day, I've heard it said this way, everybody needs someone who holds the dagger. What does that mean? Everybody needs people in their life that could end you with the facts they know about you because you've been open with another human being. And if we don't have that connection with other people, I've got people in my life that know me and know my hurt and know where I hurt. If you don't have somebody who knows where you hurt, you're set up for pain, you're set up for more failure. And you've got to get to the place, you've got to get to the place where you are sharing your hurt so you can then better empathize with someone when they're hurting. That's why small groups are important. You're never going to find a friend just sitting at home watching TV. You, you've got to find a way to engage with humanity, and that is being vulnerable with it, and that's a little scary, but it's totally worth it. And so we're going to listen for the hurt, and we're going to share our hurts with other people, be vulnerable and honest. We're going to quiet down. We're going to breathe. We're going to listen and lower our voice. And number five, we're going to pray. Even in the moment while we're listening, we're gonna, in, we're gonna in prayer bring it. Look, I brought a verse in from Judges. It's not in Proverbs, but Gideon, it says, Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Now, when he built that altar to the Lord in, in Judges chapter six, there was no peace. There was no peace to be found in that moment. It was, his life had just been completely upended and he was full of fear and, and he was scared and anxious and, and he was full of self-doubt and his internal dialogue was awful. You can read it in Judges chapter six and see how terrible he thought of himself. And in the moment of being called into a new season and being scared and there was chaos all around him, the Israelites had been devastated by the Philistines and they, they, they were all hiding. In the moment of complete chaos, he decided to build an altar and let his self die, which is where altars are where things go to die, and named it peace. In the middle of chaos, you've got to build an altar and bring it to God, even if it's in the moment. So what I said to, that, to God in the middle of the conversation with that young lady is, God, help me respond the way you would at the DMV, even though you never had to deal with that. Help me respond. Because Jesus was beaten and murdered by people that he responded well to. I think I can handle a 27-year-old at the DMV if there's no pride involved. Build an altar. Build an altar. He brought, Gideon brought his whole self to God and allowed his will to submit. When you're in a conflict, stop, make a mental altar and ask God to calm your fears. And when he does, you'll slow your pace, you'll quiet your voice, and you'll start to listen. Number six, seek to see their perspective. But I don't want to, because they're wrong. (laughs) I would like you to refer back to the verse on pride. I can't, no, I don't want to see it from their perspective. If they would just see it my way, then we would all be fine. Go back to the pride verse again. Seek to see it from their perspective. Look what Philippians says. Don't look to your own interests, 
or your wants or your perspective or your own needs. Don't start looking at your own self first when you're in the middle of this mess. Look up and look to the needs of someone else. Try to see it from their perspective. <laughs> in our relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. Now look at this picture. Same picture from a different perspective. One guy says, look a boat. And another guy says, look land. Same picture, completely different perspective. We've all been at the place where we've been misunderstood because our perspective was not considered and that does hurt. Let's go back to the brain though. The ability to see things from someone else's perspective is dependent upon the executive functioning between mental sets. What does that mean? That means in order to see things from another person's perspective, we have to activate the entire network of our brain regions. So when, when thinking about the mindset of another person, this was in that, that test I referred to, when we're trying to think about the mindset of another person and we're trying to see things from their perspective, our prefrontal cortex is, is activating, not the limbic system. So it's, you're unable physiologically to see things from someone else's perspective when you're trying to die on your hill. Have you ever brought truth to a situation and someone left still mad because they just didn't like the truth of it or they just wanted to prove their point? They're, they're in the limbic system. They're unable to see it intelligently because we're in the limbic system. It's, it's our social cognition goes out the window. Our memory goes out the window. The integration goes out the window when we get into lower thought. So what does that mean? Bottom line, if all you feed your brain is your phone, you're gonna live in an ocean of conflict. I'll prove it to you. If your brain is consistently fed trash, you're gonna experience trash. Why? Because our brains are living in the lower part of thought and we are constantly entertained and do not have daily higher thinking or reasoning. And when we do, our relationships suffer. It's called amusement. Amusement, the definition of amusement the word literally means muse is thought and a is without. It's the negative article. The word amusement means without thought. Have you ever had an intelligent thought on a roller coaster? <laughs> no. You're just like, wee! Ah! And then they get you to buy a $15 picture you'll never see again on the way out because you're so jacked up on adrenaline. And you've been amused to the point where you give them more money for that addiction. It's quite the trick. Next time you go to SeaWorld, I just ruined it for you again. And I think that there's this amusement that we live our lives in. We live without thought all day. We open our phones. You've never scrolled through Facebook and felt smarter at the end. Never. You felt angry and agitated and dumber because we have been amused. We, we are in the limbic system, death scrolling, doom scrolling with our thumbs and allowing our minds to sink lower and lower and lower into reactivity and then we live our lives that way. And we wonder why our lives are so full of conflict. We're not allowing God to speak. We're not allowing us to see people from other, their perspective. And then number seven, you gotta take full ownership of your stuff. You gotta take full ownership. And here's the thing that you don't wanna hear. Whether the other party owns up to their part does not affect this. Don't you wish it could? Because the other party may never apologize. You may go to your deathbed without the other party ever trying to see it from your perspective and ever trying to come clean and ever owning their part. So what are you going to do? Live the rest of your life in angst and worry and doubt and your limbic system like an animal? Are we going to allow ourselves to mature as Christians and sit at a table in love even though we don't like each other at the moment and talk and bring intelligent thought to the conversation and seeing things from someone else's perspective and saying it calmly and quietly and allowing the way God designed us as the most intelligent beings he's ever created to deal with something intellectually and on purpose. But whether or not someone does that with you or for you in that moment does not affect us doing these seven things. But you and I have got to admit fully the part of the conversation for which we caused, 
by our own insecurities, by our own insensitivities, by our own immaturities, through our own biases, through our own poor behavior and choices. We can own that part. And I think sometimes the devil sneaks in and he explodes. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again real quick as the band comes out and gets ready to help me. The devil's name is where Spanish gets the word Diablo. It's a Greek compound word, dia and balo. The Spaniards didn't think of it, the Greeks did. Two words, dia and balo. Dia is where we get the word diameter, right through the middle. Balo is where we get the word ballistic missile. The devil's name literally means to come right in between you and another person and explode. That's his only job. It's to get right between you and your church and separate. To get right between you and your spouse and separate. To get right between you and your children and explode. To get right between you and your boss and explode. Anywhere you see separation, the devil is involved. Where you see people coming together to talk, wisdom's involved. And the devil is not wise in that regard. Look what Matthew 7 says. Why is it that you can see the dust in your brother's and, brother and sister's eye, but you can't see what's in your own eye? Don't ignore the wooden plank in your eye when you deal with a speck of sawdust in your brother's eyelash. That type of criticism and judgment is a sham. Remove the plank from your own eye, then perhaps you might be able to see clearly to help your brother flush out his sawdust. Before you start working on the splinter in your spouse, you gotta deal with the telephone in your own eye, telephone pole in your own eye. We gotta own our own stuff. And we have to own the parts of the conversation where we let the devil come in and explode. And we've got to own those moments. Nobody can own that for you. We have to own those moments. And can I just say this too? Saying I'm sorry is a really cheap thing. Those are cheap words. I'm sorry. It's cheap language. It's, how about, will you forgive me for the specific example, whatever it is? I'm asking your forgiveness for the way I spoke to you. I'm asking for your forgiveness for the way I treated you last night when I was tired. I ask for your forgiveness for flying off the handle, lady at the DMV. I'm asking for forgiveness for escaping this conversation that was hard. I don't wanna run from it anymore. I'm asking your forgiveness. And can I say to you, leave the butts out of it because everything before the butt is bull. I'm asking your forgiveness for this when you were an idiot. Every, you know, but you were, no. Leave your butt out of it and just ask specifically for forgiveness. Own your stuff. And if you're feeling some anxiety even in this moment, if you're sitting there thinking too, man, I hope that they're hearing this message right now. What do you have to own? Nothing. No, there's something. It's the Texas two-step something you can own. Unless it's like a severely abusive situation and that is a very particular subset in most conflict, there's something we can all own. So as you go ahead and stand to your feet, and I'm gonna ask the prayer team to go ahead and come down as so we get ready to end our service today with response time. I wanna ask you, what are your current conflicts right now? What are your current conflicts right now? The prayer team is here every Sunday and they wanna pray with you about that conflict. And is it something at work? Is it something at home? Is it something between you and your spouse? What is it? Where is the devil getting right in the middle and separating? They're here to pray with you about that. They're here to pray with you about anything, whether it has to do with that or not, but specifically for today. Where are your conflicts? And there's two conflicts I wanna highlight. One of them is a spiritual conflict. What does that mean? You are in sin. 
And there is a spiritual conflict between where you want to be with God and where your behaviors are actually taking you. There's this conflict. And that can be settled today through repentance and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that before, today's your day. They want to pray with you and pray a prayer of faith over you. And you can, you can say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and he will immediately save your soul and live in your heart. The Bible is very clear about how simple that process is. There's some of you that have received Jesus before and you've walked away intentionally and you've done things that have clouded your judgment and clouded things and you're trying and things aren't working. There's a spiritual conflict. Come down to the altar and the altar is where things go to die and allow these parts of us to be submitted to God just like Gideon did and build an altar of peace for your life today. And then there's the relational conflict and you need, you need wisdom in your life to navigate these situations. And let me be very honest in saying it this way. If there is a relational conflict in your life and you have not asked for God's wisdom on it, you're doing it wrong. 100% of the time, you're doing it in your own logical thought process and that will only leave you alone and full of pain. So allow someone to pray with you and get God's wisdom on the situation. Landon, I don't, I don't want to come up to the altar. Can I tell you something? We put the prayer team up at the front because you need to be responsible for taking a step towards the altar and leaving things here that you don't need to take home. This is the safest place in the world for you to take a step forward. That's why they're up here. We don't want you to take a step backward. We want you to take a step forward. I don't want anybody looking at me. No one's paying attention to you. They didn't come here to look at you. They're thinking about their own conflict and it's not with you. So maybe it is, maybe you should be up here with them, I don't know. If your spouse comes up here and you don't, come up here. You're probably involved. <laughs> so whatever it is, let's get God's wisdom on it, okay? Don't let the word be spoken to your heart and leave here with the same conflict. You can have the peace that surpasses all human understanding come into your situation today, even though the circumstances might not have yet changed, peace can come to your heart. And I hope that in this moment, you'll wake up tomorrow morning, you'll, you'll find peace and you'll wake up tomorrow morning and you just feel different because there's peace in your life. The prayer team's here to pray with you. There's communion on the sides of the room. You want to grab a cup, take it back to your seat and just pray and thank Jesus for his blood and his body that was broken and spilled for you so you could have the forgiveness of sin and not pay for your own sin with your own blood. He did it for you for eternity. And the band's gonna lead us in a song. And while they're singing, that's our response time. For just the next five minutes, we're gonna respond to what God said. So they're only gonna be up here for about five minutes. So when we start singing, come down and receive prayer today. Let's lift our hands to the Lord in this moment, surrender completely. Father, we bring all of this to you. We surrender to you completely. Father, I pray for peace to come over every home represented in this building today. That the shalom, the peace of God would come and flood our heart and soul. That, that conflict that is, is, has lodged itself in our heart and is becoming bitterness. We pray that those chains and lies of bitterness be broken today in Jesus' name. And that Jesus Christ, the Savior of reconciliation, would bring peace to our pain. And God, we pray that as we come to the altar today, an anointing would flow. And that there would be peace come into our soul. In Jesus' name, and everybody said.